I am Dr. Fuzi Slisli and I will be your guide in this session. Today we will be talking about Renaissance poetry uh, and about one of the most important aspects of Renaissance poetry and one of the most important genre, poetic genre of Renaissance literature, it's the sonnet. Um, so uh, this lecture will basically give you a background and then it will describe, it will go to discuss the form and the content of the sonnet, its main characteristics, and so on. I hope that you will enjoy it and find it very useful. Um, first of all, when we talk about Renaissance literature or Renaissance poetry, the first thing uh, that's of utmost importance, because it's the main ingredient, is classical influences, the influences of classical Rome and classical Greece. Um, on Renaissance poetry. The growth of poetry in Renaissance England was profoundly influenced by a renewed interest in classical poetry. Um, classical poetry was influential in many ways. First of all, it encouraged, it encouraged Renaissance Europeans to grant the poet a higher social status, right? Uh, it made the idea that, look, the poet should be respected, should be a respected person in society. This idea, the, when people advanced this idea, they would support it from uh, classical culture. They would say, look, the Greeks and the Romans gave huge respect to the poet. They were civilized people. If we want to be civilized too, we have to give the poet a higher, a very respectable status. So classical poetry encouraged granting the poet a higher social status. And the second important thing, classical poetry provided a, a rich and huge storehouse, a storehouse of poetic styles and genre. Um, it, for example, Classical poetry provided a system of classification. Uh, not only classical poetry provided examples in this genre or that genre, and it provided, uh, it also provided a system of classification for poetry. For example, uh, it became uh, common among Renaissance uh, poet poetry culture uh, that the pastoral form, the pastoral poem, it's a poem about uh, nature basically and shepherds in shepherds in, in, in nature in the countryside it's called the pastoral uh, it's the most it's the humblest the most humble form of or genre of poetry so you know Renaissance culture accepted this classification that uh, the pastoral is the humblest form of poetry uh, the Renaissance also accepted the fact that the epic poem, the epic poem, is the uh, most prestigious form of poetry. Uh, this, the, this is a classification that existed in classical Rome, and Renaissance Europe accepted it and, uh, and, and started working with it. The most ambitious Renaissance poets imitated the poetic career of Virgil. Virgil, the, Rom the famous Roman poet who wrote the Aeneid and many other poems. So ambitious Renaissance poets imitated the career of Virgil, which means that they began their career as uh, writing pastoral poetry and gradually worked their way up to the epic. And this passage, this pathway, is what they called the Virginian wheel the Virginian wheel. It means that as a poet you start writing pastoral poetry and gradually you make your way up and you write epic poems. Um, the pastoral, um, for example, um, or uh, briefly, uh, let me give you some of the most important uh, classical influences as far as the different poetry genre are considered. For example, for the pastoral poetic tradition, the pastoral genre, uh, the Theocritus, who was a 3rd century BC poet, was very influential in the Renaissance. 
Virgil, who wrote the Eclogues, especially his book, The Eclogues, uh, written around 37 BC, and his collection of poems, The Georgics, uh, written in 29 BC, these are three collections of pastoral poetry, uh, one, one by Theocritus, it's called The Idols, uh, published in the 3rd century BC, or written in the 3rd century BC. Uh, the second one, Virgil's Eclogues, uh, written in 37 BC, and Virgil's uh, Georgics, written in 29 BC. These were the three most important influences as far as pastoral poetry was concerned. When we talk about the epic, the most important classical influences, of course, is Homer, and especially his the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, estimates is that they were written around 700 or 600 BC. Uh, also, a very important influence, as far as the epic is concerned, was Virgil, and especially his epic poem, the Aeneid, which was written uh, around 29 or 19 BC. <coughs> As far as love poetry is concerned, the most important influence was uh, the Roman poet Ovid, especially his Metamorphosis, which was written in 43 BC, and it was translated into English in 1565. Uh, Metamorphosis uh, by the Roman poet Ovid was very, very influential. Uh, its mythological tales, the mythological stories of metamor metamorphosis, were a rich resource on love and desire, and its stylistic elegance offered a model for imitation and for emulation. Ovid, the Roman poet Ovid, was controversial as an ethical model because his poetry uh, uh, talked a lot about uh, had some sexual content and uh, it addressed questions of love very often so it was controversial in the Renaissance. Poets, some poets imitated Virgil and many people in the Renaissance rejected Virgil because it was unethical and, and uh, disrespectful. So Ovid was controversial. Some critics hailed him as a, a teacher of great wisdom and learning and other critics condemned him as a corrupter of youth. There is also satiric poetry, and here the most important influence was Horace and Juvenal, who both offered contrasting and different models for uh, Renaissance poets. Um, besides classical influences on poetry, there was also native European influences. For the pastoral form, uh, there was also influences from medieval English authors like William Langland and uh, also uh, pastoralists like Jacopo Sanaza, uh, sorry, uh, Jacopo Sanazaro, uh, who was an Italian pastoral uh, poetry writer. Uh, he was also very influential on the development of English pastoral poetry. Also, as far as epic poetry is concerned. There was also influences besides classical influences. There were influences from medieval English, English romance. For example, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. This is a famous medieval poem, epic poem, written between 1375 and 1400. There was also the influence of the Italian epic poem, the famous Italian epic poem, The Divine Comedy, written by Dante uh, between 1308 and 1321. Uh, also, the famous epic poem Orlando Furioso, written by the Italian Ariosto between, uh, in 1516 and 1532. And also the famous poem by Tasso, the Italian humanist and poet Tasso, the famous uh, epic poet Gerusalemme Liberata. In 15, written in 1581. So besides the classical influences, there was also contemporary and continental influences. As far as the sonnets 
is concerned, there was the huge influence of Petrarch, which was just known as Petrarchism, and Petrarch was an Italian humanist, of course. Uh, the sonnet takes its name from the Italian poet Francesco Petrarca, who uh, was born in 1304 and died in 1374. Petrarch was most famous for the Consonier, which was a collection it was written in 1327, between 1327 to 1368. And the Consonier was a sequence of 366 lyrical po poems. Uh, and there were most of them about his love for a beautiful woman called Laura. Um, we never know what happens to Laura. She's mostly absent, but most of his poems are an expression of love for this lady, Laura. Most of the poems are sonnets, and this is a new type of poem, of poetry, whose invention is attributed to Giacomo Dallantino in the 13th century, and it was popularized across Europe by Petrarch, and especially by his collection, yeah. The Consonier. Petrarch's poems have many recurrent features, they have some recurrent characteristics that quickly became conventional topoi, they became conventional rules or motifs in European love poetry. Now uh, in Europe it's simply conventional uh, European love poetry uh, simply became called uh, the Petrarchan mode. The uh, sonnet simply became mode, the pet, the, became known as the Petrarchan mode. Very important for the development of poetry in English poetry in the Renaissance is the question of uh, patronage. Uh, in the 16th century, poetry was a genre closely uh, identified with the royal court. Those who wrote poetry were mostly either courtiers in the courts or they were educated aspiring men, right? The, uh, and occasionally even women, uh, but they were ambitious uh, men or some women who were in, s in search of royal patronage. For Elizabethan courtiers, for example, the ability to write artful poetry was part of being an accomplished gentleman. It was just part of being an accomplished, uh, talented, ambitious gentleman. You had to be able to write and compose and recite poetry. Uh, same thing for women, but women did not have a strong presence like the men. It was also a way of cultivating rhetorical and persuasive skills necessary in Renaissance politics and diplomacy. If you want to be a successful politician or diplomat, it was necessary to be able to write and read and compose and discuss poetry. Poetry was a very good skill to have for people with political ambitions. For those outside the court, poetry was also a way of winning favors or patronage from a monarch or a king or a prince, uh, especially for those who now seek to make a living as professional poets. This is something new. It's only during the Renaissance that the idea of uh, people becoming professional poets and making a living out of their writing and their poetry, it only starts taking shape during the Renaissance. Patronage uh, is what made this possible because patronage provided a status because you are part of this court or this court or, and it provided income which is very important for a poet to sit down at home or in the garden or wherever and try to write poetry. So it's for this reason that many of the poets of the Renaissance write about and for the court. Uh, a lot of the poetry of the Renaissance it's either for the courts or it is about the court. This situation changes only in the 17th century because there is in the 17th century there is a rise of a merchant class who is uh, wealthy and rich enough to offer uh, alternative venues, alternative places for poetry and aspirant poets to come and read and recite and write their poetry. Also important for Renaissance English literature uh, is an event that will give a huge boost to English uh, poetry. Uh, 
it's the passage from manuscript to print. Most Renaissance poetry circulated in manuscript form. Uh, these are handwritten documents that, you know, the poet would, or a scribe would write them down and they would circulate in small copy because you can only write so many. And uh, <clears throat> a series, basically what changed this situation, is a series of landmark publications in the late 16th century and the early 17th century set a new precedent uh, for printing collections of poetry uh, and helped make print the more common form of distribution and publication of poetry. One of the earliest collections to be published was the Songs and Sonnets that was published by Richard Tottel, Tottel, T-O-T-T-E-L, and uh, Songs and Sonnets was published in 1557, 1557, better known, it's mostly known, it's a famous, you know, book because it was such a landmark, such an important event, and it's simply known as Tortel's Mis Miscellany. It consisted of previously unpublished lyrics by Henry Howard, the Earl of Surrey, Sir Thomas Wyatt, and others. The movement from manuscript to print took the poem for, from their original intimate context because when it's in a manuscript it's in a limited number and it circulates uh, in intimate settings. It's only the poet and his close friends and close relatives. But now because of printing, poetry, the poem is available for a mass public. Um, so it moved um, the poem from their original in intimate context into the wider public. This obliged publishers, first of all, publishers became obligated to add titles or explanatory prefaces, sometimes titles to poems, to uh, collections, or often explaining how such a private poem or poems could be presented to a wider public. The success of Tortel's Miscellany, in, uh, written in 1557, showed that there was a market for printed poetry. Um, the the uh, posthumous publication of Sir Phil Philip Sidney's sonnets, uh, they were published after his death. It's called Astrophil and Stella, and they were published after his death in 1591 and his collected works of Sir Philip Sidney in 1598 also had a significant impact on the history of printed poetry and, make it more, uh, and made it more acceptable, especially among elite poets. Because at this time, people distrusted publications, distrusted print. They still preferred that their poetry circulated in small numbers among select elite of friends and in intimate settings. They were scared that print would open poetry to a larger public and would spoil uh, the poetic tradition. The volume of Philip Sidney set a precedent for the publication of single author collections, the collection of a single author, uh, which became very pro uh, popular and profitable in the early 17th century. In 1616, for example, Ben Johnson, uh, he went even further and oversaw the publication of his own poetic and dramatic works, right? He oversaw the, saw the publication of his own works in a very attractive folio edition. Uh, this format, the folio, is generally reserved for learned publications. And of course, at this point, English poetry is still not considered learned, right? Remember, this is a time when Latin is still important. So although there is some poetry in English and German and French and Italian, it's still not prestigious enough to become, you know, worthy of being published in a folio. So when Ben Johnson did this and published his own works in a folio, this was a groundbreaking event and a new and a precedent that made future publications possible. Of course, Ben Johnson published his works in 1616 and in 1623 we have 
uh, Shakespeare's famous first folio is published in 1623. And editions of the poems of John Donne and George Herbert appeared in 1633. Um, the nature or the function of poetry in Elizabethan culture uh, was basically designed to teach its readers religious, ethical, and civic lessons. Religious, ethical, and civic lessons. Uh, later, Elizabethan poets continued to be concerned with instruction, but they believed that poetry was more likely to teach its readers if it amused and entertained them. So, after the Renaissance, the educational dimension becomes smaller, and the entertainment and amusement and pleasure uh, part of poetry starts taking a bigger shape and a bigger uh, uh, size in poetry. Um, poets at this time still could not say directly what they wanted. Um, you know, there was humanism, uh, the Renaissance uh, opened, created an atmosphere for freedom of speech, but still poets were not free to say anything they wanted. The popularity in late Elizabethan period of the pastoral and the sonnet was primarily due to the fact that these two genres allowed poets what they want what they want to say indirectly so they can say what they want to say in an indirect fashion in the epic they can talk about political matters and in the sonnet they can talk about you know either love or moral or ethical issues so um, let's talk a little bit about the sonnet and the characteristics of the sonnet um, to speak about English Renaissance poetry, one has to start with the sonnet. This is the literary form that emerged from Italy first and spread across Europe like wildfire. In the last decade of the 16th century, no other lyric, uh, no other poetic form compared in popularity with the sonnet. The sonnet was the most popular form of poetry. It's short, as we will see and easier to understand. The sonnet is a short poem, usually emotional in content. The form was first developed in Italy during the Middle Ages by well-known figures like Dante Allegri, uh, who, uh, and he, because he put it to use. But the most famous sonneteer of that time was Francesco Petrarca, Petrarch, 1304, 1374 and it is after him that the Italian sonnet it's after him it's from him that the Italian sonnet got its name so it's either called the sonnet or it's called Petrarchism or the Petrarchan sonnet um, it has been estimated it was so popular the sonnet was so popular that it has been estimated that in the course of the century over 300,000 sonnets were written in Western Europe. 300,000 sonnets. Petrarch's example was still commonly followed. People still followed Petrarch's sonnets and imitated Petrarch's sonnets. The sonnets were generally composed in sequences, cycles, of a hundred or more. So they would be their short poems. So uh, they were composed in a sequence of a hundred poems or more. And they addressed to the poet's more or less imaginary cruel lady. The Italian or Petrarchan sonnet was introduced into English poetry in the early 16th century by Sir Thomas Wyatt in 1503 uh, until 1542. By, the, by far the finest of all English poetry or English sonnets in the English tradition, the best English sonnets are Shakespeare's, of course. Um, 154 poem collection. Commonly known, they're just known as Shakespeare's sonnets. They were not published until 1609, 1609, but seem to have been written before 1600. Their interpretation has uh, uh, long been hotly debated. 
and there is strong disagreement over when was it published, whether you know some whether some of it doesn't belong to him, and so on. It is certain, however, that they do not form a connected sequence. That's certain. They are not part of a connected sequence. Some of them are occupied with urging a youth of high rank, Shakespeare's patron, who may have been either the Earl of South Southampton or William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, to marry. So some of them just Earl this important prince to marry. Others hint to Shakespeare's infatuation for a dark lady, leading to, a, to bitter disillusion and still others seem to be occasional expressions of devotion to other male or female friends. The sonnet um, can be divided into two sections, thematically and in terms of form. There is the form and there is the themes. Thematically, the sonnet can be divided into two sections. There is two parts. The first part uh, presents the theme or raises an issue or asks a question. The second part answers the question or resolves the problem or drives home the poem of uh, the point of the of the poem. This change in the poem is called the turn when we move from presenting the question and then providing an answer this turn is this this transition this change is generally called as the turn and it moves the emotional action of the poem from the climax to a resolution. As far as the form is concerned, the Petrarchan sonnet has 14 lines and they are divided into uh, two sections. The first section has eight lines and it's called the octave, you know, the octave meaning it's eight lines. And the second part has six lines and it's called the, sec the uh, sestet, which means that it has six lines. Sestet means it has six lines. The octave the first eight lines present the problem and the sestet, the final six lines, provide a, a solution to the problem. Um, the the as sonnet also has a, a, a rhythm scheme. It has, a, it has specific uh, rhythm and rhyme schemes that are specific to the sonnet. The Petrarchan sonnet um, <clears throat> typically featured no more than four or five rhymes. It used a specific rhyme and it varies, it, it, so it uses four or five rhymes in a poem. For example, there would be A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, which means that the first line, uh, the end rhyme is A, the second rhyme uh, ends in B, the third one ends in B, the fourth and fifth one go back to ending in AA and the fifth and sixth go back to ending in BB and the eighth one goes back to rhyme with A. So this is what it means that the rhyme scheme is A, BB, AA, BB and A. And the sestet, the second part, the rhyme scheme would be CDE, meaning that for example, the rhyme, the, the, the lines would end with a, a rhyme C, D, and E, and then the three last lines would end with a rhyme C, D, and E. So three lines would rhyme with three lines. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> the Italian Petrarchan sonnet, therefore, is uh, divided into two sections. It has an octave, which means eight lines. The uh, the octave raises the question, states a problem, or presents a brief narrative, and it has a, a rhyme scheme that varies. It can vary the rhyme scheme. For example, the most common is A, B, B, A, A, B, B, and A, and would have a sestet. The second part would have six lines. That's a sestet. And the sestet answers the question, solves the problem, or comments on the narrative. The uh, rhyme scheme would be, for example, C, D, E, C, D, E. And if this sounds a little bit confusing, you'll probably have, uh, you will have in the, on the website, there will be an illustration with uh, uh, images and stuff that can make this clearer than what I am making it here. The English Shakespearean sonnets 
is slightly different. It is not, uh, it doesn't divide into two parts, it divides into four parts. It doesn't have eight lines and six lines, it has four and four and four, which means 12, and then it concludes with two lines, which means 14. So basically, <clears throat> each of the four lines is called a quatrain, which simply means four lines, a quatrain. So we have uh, three quatrains and one couplet. A couplet means a, it has two lines. Uh, so three quatrains and two lines. That means 14 lines all in all. Each of the quatrain uh, of the English or the Shakespearean sonnet usually explores one aspect of the main idea. So there is one main idea and each of the three quatrains would explore one aspect of it. Uh, stating a problem, raising a question and or presenting a narrative situation. The final couplet, the last two lines, would present a startling or a seemingly contra uh, contrasting concluding statement. That's basically the Shakespearean sonnet. It's not so much different from the Petrarchan sonnet. It just varies in the form. Instead of having eight and six, the Shakespearean sonnet has four, 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 and two. And of course, the rhyme, the rhyme scheme varies. So it would be, for example, the first quatrain would have A, B, A, B. The second quatrain would have C, D, C, D. The third quatrain would have a rhyme scheme of E, F, E, F. And then the couplet, the closing uh, two lines, would have a rhyme scheme of G, G. Uh, this is more or less the uh, difference between the Petrarchan sonnet and the Shakespearean sonnet. In the next lecture, we will look at a specific uh, sonnet, an English uh, sonnet. Uh, most likely it will be Milton's sonnet. And we will look at these uh, uh, distinctions more in details and in practice. And we will try to apply these uh, 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 principles on uh, a specific poem from the English Renaissance. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa ta'ala wa barakatuh.